Um, uh, hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to this uh, somewhat extraordinary meeting of the Schusterman Center Ongoing Scholar Seminar in Israel Studies. Delighted that you could uh, be here today. Um, and indeed, because Zoom and the internet uh, have been having troubles today to the extent to which you please could mute uh, your audio as well as video, uh, that would be um, very, very helpful. Um, our audience, uh, before I introduce our speaker, um, in the, also we are finishing earlier than we usually do, usually go for an hour and a half. Today we'll be going just for an hour, and so I'll be dis we'll be dispensing with the regular round uh, that we do of introductions, other than to say that um, our participants here are a mix of students, undergraduate and graduate students, uh, faculty of Brandeis, faculty from the Department of Near East Judaic Studies, as well as from other departments and other centers, as well as academics and other um, uh, close observers of Israel at other universities, including people who have been fellows in some of the Schusterman uh, Center's programs um, over the years. Um, now, I will uh, briefly hand it over to our uh, speaker, um, to our presenter today, uh, Professor Uri Abuluf, um, about questions. Um, if you have questions, I suggest that you uh, send them to me in the group chat, and I will try to put them together. Um, and our one of our rules here at the Schusterman Center is that students ask uh, the first rounds of questions, and uh, which also means that in terms of um, set questions sent to me by chat, uh, the priority goes to questions by students, and then hopefully we'll have time for further discussion. So without any further ado, I give you Professor Uriel Abulu. Uriel, Uriel Abulov is Associate Professor of Politics at Tel Aviv University and is, an, is a research fellow at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School and at the Truman Institute. Um, since the last fall, he's also been an Israel Institute visiting professor at Cornell's Department of Government. He discusses his, his work focuses on the politics of fear, happiness and hope, legitimation, social movements, existentialism, nationalism, and ethnic conflicts, which is to say Israel, but not only. <laughs> In 2016, he received the Young Scholar Award in Israel Studies. He leads an um, online course for Princeton. Good to know as we're all transiting, transiting into this online world. Um, his course, Hope, Human Odyssey to Political Existentialism, which has won awards for top online course and number one of all times and from Class Central in political science and philosophy. Among his recent books are The Mortality and Morality of Nations from Cambridge University Press, Living on the Edge, the Existential Uncertainty of Zionism from Haifa University Press, which has won Israel's award for best academic book. He's also co-editor of Self-Determination and Double-Edged Concept, Communication, Legitimation, Morality, and More in Politics. And he's currently working on three book projects, one on Israel-Palestine conflict um, from existential conflict to coexistence, one called Abyss and Horizon, a second Abyss and Horizon, Political Existentialism and Humanity's Midlife Crisis. <laughs> We'll talk a bit about that. <laughs> and finally, death, meaning, and the pursuit of meaning, which makes us, which is my, what, on what makes us human and beyond politics, that a subject of great interest to me. I teach a course in human rights and always tell the students that discussing the human part of human rights is no less important than discussing the rights part of human rights. His articles have appeared in journals such as International Studies Quarterly, Nations Nationalism, British Journal of Sociology, and more. And last but not least, Ariel and I first met several years ago when we were both on the editorial board of a wonderful journal called Eretz Acheret, founded yep. by the visionary journalist and public intellectual Bam Shelleg, who has since yep. uh, passed away. Um, but uh, it was impossible to miss, uh, in our work, editorial work together, it was impossible to miss um, Ariel's intelligence, sophistication, and great human understanding, which we are all about to benefit now. So from now, so thank you all for coming on and uh, Riel Abulu, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much, Yuda. Thank you for inviting me and under those circumstances in particular. I don't have much experience with that and I'll do my best. So hello everyone, even though I cannot see um, uh, most of you. Um, you know, I've been struggling a lot before this talk for obvious reasons, right? Some of them technological. Uh, but mostly about the content. Uh, initially, when we planned the discussion, what I had in mind is that we'll devote, you know, about half an hour or so to discuss the case of Israel, Israeli politics, and then move on to discuss what I call the global crisis of liberalism, myself and many others uh, call it that. But, 
you know, under those circumstances, I thought that we should probably reverse the order uh, and start with the global crisis. Um, I have a presentation ready, which includes far too many slides for me to actually be able to um, show it all. Let me just make sure that you can actually see it and please do tell me if you don't. Can you see the presentation? Yes, Ariel, we can. Okay, cool. So let me move it into a full screen mode. Does it work? You're good. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a couple of uh, uh, my books. Uh, some of the themes that I will relate to uh, throughout the hours um, relates to some of them, uh, especially the mortality and morality of nations. Uh, but really, I would like to start with the crisis um, in which we are living at the moment. And, you know, the more I thought about it, the more it seems to me like it taps into that very renowned fable of the elephant, not just the elephant in the room, right? We know what is the elephant in each and every one of our rooms, but the elephant and the blind man. Uh, to those of you who are not familiar with the fable, I guess that the picture possibly conveyed the whole deal. So all those blind people are touching various parts of the elephant, trying to make sense of what is that huge thing that is before them. And of course, each and every one of them reaches a different conclusion. Uh, the one uh, touching the trunk would think it's a snake or the tail would think it's a, uh, is a, is a rope. And I think that to a large extent, the coronavirus crisis is exactly that, uh, the sort of a big elephant that each and every one of us is trying to figure out. And admittedly, each and every one of us is just seeing one part of that um, whole. And what we are seeing tells something about that whole, but I think it equally tells something about us. And I think that I'm no different in that respect. What I see in that crisis is the sort of things that I'm interested in. And one of the things that I'm very interested in is those moments in which we find ourselves facing dilemmas, facing choices. Now, in each and every uh, one of our lives right now, there is the, the mundane, the daily choice uh, when it comes, for example, to social distancing, right? Whether to do that or not and to what extent, uh, sort of personal decision that we make on a daily basis. And then, of course, there is the larger uh, public dilemma, public choice, if, if you will, throughout this crisis. And I think now, especially with uh, Trump's decision to perhaps alleviate many of the restrictions in about two weeks, it almost boils down to the point of asking ourselves, um, which are we willing to sacrifice? Which weak group are we willing to sacrifice more? The elderly, the less healthy one, or the poor? And it's a, it's a remarkable, painful dilemma. The more time goes by and uh, we hold on to these social distancing practices. But then I think another dilemma, perhaps even larger still, looms. And it looms on the horizon, the horizon beyond this current crisis, because this crisis will end eventually in a matter of weeks, perhaps months, maybe a couple of years. But where do we find ourselves after that? And here, I think, is the greater dilemma. And in a sense, for me, what we face now is humanity's either or moment. When it comes to our system, the systems that gave us those dilemmas, right? The system that has made us consider whether we want to help more the poor or the sick. We have to come to grasp with that sort of dilemma and to start to think whether we want to sustain that system or to substantially transform it. And there are, of course, many elements, but so much of that has to do with how we conceive of liberalism, both politically and economically. Now, politically, the choice, to a certain extent, would be between various modes of liberal democracy and authoritarianism, because the crisis biologically wise, started with China, but also economically and politically. At the same time, however, people are looking at China, the Chinese model, and are saying to a certain extent, look, this is working. 
the authoritarian way of handling this crisis seems to be working. What sort of clue would we get from that? And economically as well, the question of neoliberalism. Many people are saying now, look, this is the time to showcase the weaknesses of neoliberalism in the same way that the crisis of 2008 did. And that is true to a certain extent, and even more so, more so than 2008. But there is a flip side, a very disturbing one, but one that we should readily acknowledge, which is that, you know, if we take the American case, the worst case scenario would be, as statistics is saying now, it's about 20 million people dying, which is horrible. Bear in mind, however, that we're speaking about 16 million of them that would be the elderly one, 65 and beyond. That would mean, economically speaking, if you care less about the people, that, in fact, many pensions will now not be, have to be paid. Another element is that a lot of equities will be released to the younger generation, the non-productive, the less consumer of us would be going away. And by passing away, perhaps allowing to boost neoliberal regime. And I think this moment in time provides us with exactly this sort of dilemma. And it taps into a larger project that I'm uh, engaged in that uh, uh, you mentioned, what I call humanity's midlife crisis. And at the heart of that is the sense that while we see the abyss, we seek the horizon. While we see death, personal but also collective, we are also seeking to a certain extent the horizon, the meeting of the heavenly ought and the earthly is. We try to get close to that. And the question, of course, how do we do that? And there are certain moments in times that the crisis looms, such as a midlife crisis. Ostensibly, you have achieved so much, but you have a feeling that perhaps you are not happy enough. Perhaps there is no point. Um, I'll just briefly sketch what I'm trying to do in this project and then try to connect it into the Israeli case. So basically what I'm trying to figure out is uh, the nature of political hope, of public hope. And a point of reference for me is that painting by George Watts. Uh, the painting is called Hope, but as you can see uh, from the words of, Ger of uh, George Watts and from the painting itself, it's a very bleak view of hope. It has only one string left. And I find it quite interesting that um, Barack Obama uh, referred to that painting a couple of times and of course made it very much part of his message of hope, holding on to that sense. And yet we know that after uh, Obama's two tenures, many people were disappointed, including the one who made the very famous hope poster who said that he does not believe that Obama lived up to that expectation. And if you look at those words by Obama himself, let me just, yeah. This is the paradox, Obama said, that defines our world today. The world is more prosperous than ever before, and yet our societies are marked by uncertainty and unease. And look, he's right, and he's still right. If you look at statistics, and I have many slides here that can show you some of those statistics, we won't uh, uh, dwell too much on that. The world has never been as peaceful and as prosperous as it is now. Now, statistically speaking, objectively speaking, on a global scale, this is the best time to be born, to be raised, even considering the current crisis. I mean, the numbers are pretty low, partly because humanity has advanced so much scientifically, technologically, to be able to cope with such a threat. And then we are all very much aware of the uncertainty, of the unease, of the fear. Let me give you a couple of numbers. Um, here, for example, uh, is one indication of what many scholars, there are some dis disputes about it, uh, consider to be the great decline in violence throughout human civilization and in modernity as well. This is a graph showing us the unbelievable rise in GDP per capita and the overall GDP of the world. Even poverty, worldwide poverty, have substantially declined. On the other hand, however, elements of anxiety and other forms of mental illness are on the rise. People are using various chemicals in order to cope with such mental anxieties, distress, tension. 
If you ask people in the US today, if this is the worst, the lowest time in their nation's history, throughout the generations, it doesn't matter if it's X generation like myself or millennials or baby boomers or older adults, all of them sing so much and still would say that today is the worst time, which is quite remarkable considering the statistics. And so the question that I ask myself, uh, seeing all of that, and here's an example of uh, discourse throughout the last two centuries, fear, crisis, threats, all of that rising in our public discourse. And I'm asking myself and you, why? Why is that sort of mismatch? And I think it goes to the heart of liberalism global crisis. And that crisis, I think, is partly shown by that very famous slogan of liberalism as manifested, as we all know, in the US Declaration of Independence, that basically what it is all about is preserving life, liberties, for the pursuit of happiness. And look, this is a remarkable declaration, a remarkable sentiment. And the idea behind it is, is crystal clear, right? We need to have life, liberate it, so we can seek our happiness to the utmost. But then what happens, I ask you, if it doesn't work? What happens if, as those figures show, that bearing in mind all the remarkable success of liberalism, part and parcel of the enlightenment process, what happens if all of that has not substantially improved the level of our collective and sometimes individual happiness? If liberalism was all about pursuing happiness to the utmost, doesn't our failure to achieve that also indicate that perhaps we should discard liberalism? I think this is the most acute question that we have to ask ourselves today. And I think that part of the answer lies in not acknowledging the flip side of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Nilda mentioned before the title of one of the book projects that I'm working on, and trying to tap into not just life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but also death, freedom, and the search for meaning. And that, I consider, is the task of existentialism, or even more precisely, of political existentialism. I'm trying to figure out those elements in our society, because I think that without realizing how they have played out throughout time, but especially in modernity, we cannot understand why we are amidst that crisis, and we cannot also alleviate it. So with that just the position of happiness and meaning, I want to move to the case of Israel. Now let's see how we are in terms of time. It took me 15 minutes, not just 10, to discuss the global crisis, so a bit less to Zionism. And I wouldn't read what you see in the slide now. It's the many uh, antonym, uh, antinomies of uh, Zionism, the many paradoxes that Zionism and the state of Israel as a Jewish state is made of. I'll only refer to uh, the latter one, which is, I think, quite remarkable, which is that even though Israel is one of the strongest countries worldwide in terms of its military capacity, predominantly because of its nuclear capacity, Israel and Israelis, especially Israeli Jews, still see themselves as weak, are still very fearful of their survival. And I'm asking myself, why is that? And why the rest of the paradoxes that you can see on the screen? Politically speaking, Apropos the development uh, of today in Israel, um, and I guess that some of you have seen in the news that the blue and white party seems to be falling apart, and, they are, and that faction that is under guns is probably going to join the coalition under Netanyahu and his right-wing bloc. Um, a remarkable uh, feat for Netanyahu to be having after the last round of election, the third one. And I'm trying to figure out why. And I'm trying to tap into that dimension of politics that we don't usually pay attention to. Happiness, happiness. And again, bear in mind the question that I asked about the global crisis. If liberalism does not provide happiness, maybe we should opt for other solutions that can provide us with happiness, but are perhaps far less liberal. 
So let's think about the politics of happiness in the context of Israel. Can you actually hear that? <laughs> If you can, that's the Havana Gila. And one of the things that uh, we find in the popular uh, verses of Havana Gila is that one must be happy. And it's interesting in the context of Israeli politics of happiness, um, partly considering what Netanyahu has been doing in the last couple of years, which is repeatedly saying that Israelis are remarkably happy. And so he was telling to those left-wing politicians and people, what are you whining all about? What we have done, what I have done in Israel is remarkable. People go about happy. What do you complain about? Let's look at statistics and see if Netanyahu is right. It seems to be the case. If you look at the uh, levels of happiness, both in terms of personal happiness, personal well-being, and in terms of assessing Israel well-being, there is a substantial ongoing rise in how Israelis assess Israel's position and their own well-being, especially since Netanyahu came to power in his second round in 2009. So over a decade now, an ongoing rise in the level of happiness of Israelis, especially, of course, among right wing, but not just. And even if you look at global statistics, what you see before you now is uh, the Gallup public opinion poll, their uh, global survey of happiness worldwide. And Israel, you can see, is in a remarkable position, 13 in the world. Level of happiness that is on par with, you know, the Scandinavian, Finland, Denmark, Norway, Iceland, etc. And it is remarkable because, you know, when you think about Israel and its many, many problems, you know, at least on the face of it, it doesn't make much sense. And of course, in studies of happiness, and as some of you may know, there is a science of happiness, people are trying to figure out what makes people happy. And of course, we take into consideration both the material aspects and the mental aspects. You know, some of the material aspects are the sort that we mentioned before, globally speaking, for example, a GDP per capita, right? Or to what extent the health system is doing its job, transportation system. Do you have a job, a steady job? And mentally speaking, do you have people that you can talk with, that you can be intimate with, that you can uh, share your troubles with? Do you feel like you have a substantial support group of friends and family? All of those are issues that help us materially and mentally become happy. And so if you look at the OECD report, um, comparing Israel to other countries, and you can see the average in that black circle on the screen, whereas the blue line charts Israel's position. So what is uh, clear from looking at this chart is that in certain respects, um, Israelis are doing remarkably well. For example, if you look at life expectancy on the bottom right part, or self-reported good health. In those elements, Israel feels relatively good. Other parts, Israelis are on average, on par with other OECD countries, for example, employment or unemployment rate. And in some aspects, they are far below the OECD when it comes, for example, to satisfaction with housing or the level of pollution or the scores of the educational system. Now, what you would usually expect is that if you take all of those various factors together, the average would give you the average of life satisfaction, happiness, collective happiness. This is not the case with Israel. Israelis report far more happiness than any single indicators, even the best one can suggest. And this is a remarkable paradox. And it becomes even more intriguing when you look at the two elements of happiness, the way that um, we evaluate to what extent people are happy or not. And indicators are usually uh, discerning into two parts, 
subjective well-being and affect, which is basically emotional. The first one basically asks people to imagine a ladder with 10 steps from zero to 10. And they ask the people, okay, now that you have imagined that ladder with the worst possible life for you and the best possible life for you, tell me on what step are you on? And that would suggest their evaluation of their life, their subjective well-being. And then there is the other question, the more affective one, uh, the emotional one. To what extent do you experience certain emotions such as, you know, um, sadness or joy, being angry or contented, fear or pleasure? And people report their findings, their uh, self um, feelings. Now, you would expect that there will be some sort of correlation between those two, right? Between how people would put themselves on the ladder and their emotions, their daily emotions. And it is the case, right? It's not one by one, right? In certain cases, there is a certain gap, but mostly most of the societies uh, would feature uh, the same level of subjective well-being and of joy. Not so in the case of Israel, where you have worldwide the most remarkable gap between those two. By and large, Israelis would report remarkable subjective well-being. They would say that they are on a very high level of that ladder. But when it comes to their own emotions, not as good. They enjoy a bit less than the OECD, but they are much more angry than the OECD average, and they are much more worried and depressed. They are, however, less bored, which makes sense. And so I ask myself, and again, you, why is that? What explains those apparent paradoxes, mismatches, incongruences when it comes to Israeli happiness? And I think that part of the reason lies in what many consider to be the equation of happiness. And you can see here the basic element. Happiness, you know, very roughly speaking, is what you have divided by what you want. Okay, so if you think about it for a second, you have certain things that you want in life, right? Personally, sometimes also collectively. And the question is, to what extent do you have them? And so when we speak about the politics of happiness, the question then becomes, to what extent the public, specifically say the government, provides the people with what they want? Do they get what they want? Do they have it? The more you have what they want, the happier you are. But I think there is an element of twist here that we should bear in mind, and I think that very much form the politics of happiness in Israel and beyond that. And that's the M square that I added on the side. And by M, I basically mean the might. Might with its two meanings. Something that might happen, right? The work of imagination but also might in terms of capability, in terms of capacity, in terms of power. And bear in mind that ladder that you see uh, on the left. And that question of imagining the worst possible life for you and the best possible life for you. That word, possible, it carries some interesting meanings that goes straight to that M square. Because that simple word, possible, indicates that it's both, both about what you can imagine, right? How far can you take your imagination in terms of the best case scenario and the worst case scenario, but also what is your capacity to live up to the best case and the worst imaginary case scenario. And I think that once you tap into that M square, you can see how the politics of happiness can, not necessarily easily, but it can manipulate our level of happiness. One of perhaps the most obvious ways to go about it is, again, have a look at that equation. To have what you want, or perhaps to want what you already have. Maybe the solution to happiness is not so much to increase what you have according to what you already want, but to adjust what you want according to what you already have. And I think that that for many people 
is both personally and publicly the solution. You know that song, uh, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you live with? That's about it, right? You cannot live up to certain expectations, but maybe you can settle for what you already have. And politics, perhaps, can provide us with ways to do exactly that. Especially if, as so many memes will tell us these days, in fact, happiness is really just our own choice. It's really up to us. And if we are not happy, then we only have ourselves to blame. Another element that can greatly boost our happiness, I think, is if we manage to lower our expectations, to simply want far less. Now, think about it. Why would we want less? Why would we settle for less than our utmost dreams? Many people we know do exactly that for comfort, convenient, and whatever, but so much of that is driven by fear and anxiety. And that's the element of the politics of fear in Israeli politics that I think has a lot to do with um, why Israelis are so happy. I imagine that perhaps some of you know um, what is the photographs that I'm showing you now. It's obviously, as you can see uh, from the Magen David, and it's Israeli airplane, Air Force. They are flying over Auschwitz concentration camp. Many decades, of course, too late uh, to help the people massacred there. But I think that this photograph really captures something very substantive about Israeli collective fears and one prominent way is that we've tried to cope with that through sheer force which makes a lot of sense. We were weaker then, we want to be strong enough now. And still it is important, um, the sort of self-imagery that sometimes we, Israeli, especially Israeli Jews, have. And I, I want to make clear that by you know, outlining that, I'm not trying to pass any judgment. I'm not trying to deal with um, the supposed mismatch between Israel might and its sense of weaknesses and say, look, those people are delusional. They have no idea how strong they are. I care less, far less about that judgment, much more about fully realizing that sort of mismatch, just understanding, tapping into that public sentiment. The sense that in a way, uh, the Holocaust, um, genocide or perhaps just politicide, right? The end of Israel and looms almost always as part of the Israeli abyss. Um, I'll skip through several slides because we don't have much time. These are some interesting words by Simon Ravidovich who said that basically the Jewish people are the ever dying people, always afraid of being the last. Uh, ben Gurion said things to, um, to a similar effect that it's really the physical existence of Israel per se that uh, is always on the brink. I wanted to show you those political cartoons at the eve of 67, uh, the Six Day War. Sulik, the emblematic image of Israel being pushed by the United Nations into the abyss. And then this remarkable victory in those six days. But then I thought, how remarkable is it that just a couple of days after this unbelievable military victory, the cartoonist, Dosh, is again depicting Sulik, uh, the image of Israel at the edge, on the edge of an abyss, now almost being swollen by the Soviet shark and holding fast to its rifle, uh, lest it uh, fall and uh, die. And we don't have much time to that, but later on, and Yehuda, I can pass you the slides so people can have a look at them. It's so interesting to see how Bibi has tapped into this public fear again and again with every single public election campaign that he has run. The BBC uh, clip, for example, is remarkable. Bibi is depicting himself as a babysitter to all Israeli citizens, as if they are his kids that he is protecting. Uh, the implication, of course, is that we are, in a sense, children, that we need some sort of uh, adult support 
that sense of security that comes with the supervision of someone like Netanyahu. And he stepped again into exactly that sentiment with the lifeguard uh, clip uh, that he issued a couple of uh, months ago, where he depicts himself as the lifeguard of uh, all Israelis, keeping them self from the great menacing uh, elements that are all around them. And of course, if you look at Netanyahu's appearances in the last couple of weeks with the coronavirus um, um, discourse and practices, it's all over the place. The ways of tapping into fears, collective fears, and presenting yourself, and that's the important element. You have to present yourself as the rescuer, as the point of salvation. It's, it's just not enough to make people afraid. You have to make them feel that with you, they still have some hope for safety. So that's about the politics of fear. I also wanted to talk a bit, how much do we have? About five minutes, I see, right? Uh, if not, do tell me. I, I, I mean, I'm a bit detached from everything going on um, with you looking at me, but I hope that it's just five minutes and uh, not less that I can um, continue with the conversation. So freedom is the next element that I wanted to tap into. Freedom is really at the heart of the existentialist tradition because, you know, the main element is basically saying, look, facing death, we are searching for meaning in our world. And searching meaning in our world is basically about making choices. What do we want to opt for? What is right? What is wrong? This is how we make meaning. A meaning that provides for us a sense of almost immortality. This is how Ernst Becker, for example, saw the various cultural construction that we make in our life. Um, Albert Camus, of course, referred to that in emphasizing the always existent option of suicide. And Friedrich Nietzsche says, if you have your why in life, right? Why do I live? What do I live for? You can get along with almost anyhow. And I think those questions resonate politically as well. Um, this is part of what I mentioned in the book, but if you look at Echad Am, who said that we must seek for purpose for our existence. We cannot just settle for existence per se. Um, David Avidan said that, you know, what justifies uh, more than anything our loneliness, the great despair, is the sinful fact that we don't really have nowhere to go to. But politically speaking, bear in mind, and I try to show that in the chart, you know, Zionism, the state of Israel, the Jewish state is just one option among many for Jewish life. And, you know, I imagine that most of you now looking at me are not living in Israel. You have opted otherwise for something else. This is a valid option. This is a valid choice. Why choose Zionism? Why choose being in Israel, in the Jewish state? And I think so much of what Zionism was trying to do throughout the generation is justify that choice. And here I give just one example. You know, we mentioned before the 67 war, and here Rabin is basically justifying the Zionist cause and saying, look, no matter how strong we are in terms of our military capacity, the most important fact is our cause is finding meaning to that collectivity. But what happens, I ask you, when you don't find that meaning. When you try to justify, when you try to legitimate the state of Israel, the Jewish state, and it doesn't work. And that has been to a certain extent the case in the experience of Israelis following the Second Intifada. A growing sense that the whole world is against us no matter what. And if the whole world is against you no matter what, why should you hold on to that attempt to legitimate yourself in the eyes of the world? Perhaps it's better to just say to yourself, that's the way things are. And there is no need to feel guilty. There is no need to apologize. There is really no need to make any moral choices because that's the way things are, period. This is the politics of bad faith. This is the politics of no choice. This is the politics of saying I must instead of I choose. Saying I cannot instead of I refuse. And this is so much of the politics that we've seen in Israel over the last decade and more. And 
this politics is seen in so many elements. Um, you know, this is going way back. This is part of the uh, discourse following the Second Intifada. Again, I can send you the, the slides that you can have a, a more in-depth look at them. But, you know, one of the elements of that is that belief that we are the chosen people. And it's so much easier to be the chosen people rather than the choosing people. It's so much easier to be telling yourself that you were chosen by God. And that's just the way things are. And you are right. And you are just, no matter what the world is telling you. Then to make every single day hard choices. In so many ways, in so many ways, the politics of bad faith helps us all so much to be, in a sense, happier, to settle for what there is, because that's the way things are. And those creature comforts that we find in politics, they are all over the place. And I think Israel in that regard is an emblematic uh, image of it. And I want to conclude with these two poems um, that I find remarkable, that I really think, you know, illustrate the tension that we're living in and our willingness to embrace or reject doubt. One by Nathan Alterman, who is speaking about the devil who is trying to do away with, um, with the Jewish state. And the devil then said, he writes in his last poem, how do I overcome this besieged one, the besieged people? He has courage and talent and implements of war and wits. And then the devil reaches the conclusion, only this, shall I do? I'll dull his mind and cause him to forget the justice of his cause. Thus spoke the devil and skies fell in horror as the devil ascended to pursue his plot. The justice of the cause, hold fast to that. Have as little doubt as possible. And then that poem by Yehuda Michai. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled, like a yard. By doubt, but doubts and loves, dig up the world like a mole, a plot, and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. And I think it's remarkable that he's putting, you know, doubt and love together, because in so many ways, you know, when when you love, you are in doubt, you are in constant doubt. You know, like that game with the uh, flower leaves that she loves me, she loves me not. <laughs> this is the state of constant doubt. And the question I think for each and every one of us is our willingness to embrace that big doubt, not just personally in our lives, but also publicly, politically, and to try to make sense, a moral sense and other senses as well, and not yield to the politics of bad faith to embrace the politics of freedom, of choice, while bearing in mind that it may cost us a certain degree of happiness. We might be less happy, but I think that our lives would be all the more meaningful. That's about it. Thank you so much. And I would love to get your questions. Great. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Uriel. And I think we all can understand why your why your lectures are so remarkably popular. And you know, for those of us who work in the scholarly vineyards of you know spend our days tracking down this detail or that, it's always like really refreshing to have things uh, pulled out into a broader screen. So we've gotten some really interesting questions, and we have about 15 minutes in which to answer them. Um, so as always, we start with our students. And so um, our student Shira Malka Cohen. Um, who is a doctoral student. In Yuda, be, before that, should I read anything from the chat or just listen to the question that you asked me? Because I just opened the chat and I see so many things right. going well, on. Well, yeah, that's the thing. I'm going to, I'm going to take, take, take the privilege of sort of taking questions and putting... Okay, some, cool, cool, great. Excellent, another. thank you. That would help. So, will, so the first is from uh, Shira Malka Cohen, who's a doctoral student of ours. Um, and uh, she writes actually about today's news, but relates it very much to what you were talking about. She's... Um, Netanyahu's tactics of fear, which you've described, have been, indeed been very successful in keeping him at the helm, and his tactics seem to have worked again, as of the news that we just heard. Do you think that this will continue? Like, how long, the sort of the cycle that you're talking about, um, are there any 
drivers of changing, you know, sort of the fact that Netanyahu is able to portray himself as the national babysitter, which is something that his, his predecessors, with, that almost none of his predecessors would have tried to do or even think of themselves that way, Ben Gurion, Begin, Yitzhak Shamir, Rabin, anyone, uh, portraying themselves happily as the natural babysit, the national babysitter, and it works. Yeah. Uh, do you see any changes or vectors in Israeli society that might sort of shift the sort of underlying consciousness that that's or or not? And then we have a couple more questions to get to. Yeah. Look, it's probably one of the hardest questions that I've been struggling for for years now. Look, when we face our fears, you know, like any other animals, what we do, right? It's fight or flight or sometimes freeze. We have all this triad of reaction. But as humans, we also have the fourth, which is to think, to reflect. And sometimes thinking is terrifying. Sometimes thinking is terrifying because, again, it invites freedom. It invites choice. And this is a scary prospect. Freedom is a heavy burden. And I think that there is such a strong appeal to the politics of bad faith that to overcome it requires an immense amount of courage on the parts of both the public and the politicians. So briefly noting about Israel, look, in the last round of election, even in the last round, when Netanyahu was depicted as the great winner on the eve of election, the majority of voters voted against Netanyahu staying in power. Right? The public has spoken. What happened, however, is that certain politicians, it started with one in the Labour, Meretz, Gesher party, with other two in the Blue-White party, and today with Gantz himself, almost being so terrified to live up to their own promise. Mm -hmm. So overcoming fear requires, in politics, requires the courage of both politicians and the public. I think for three rounds now, the Israeli public was courageous enough. The politicians were not. So now we have um, we have a few more questions. There were several questions that were um, all of, along similar lines. So, with thanks to the faculty from Brandeis and elsewhere who asked them, I'll put them together. Okay. So much of your talk is based on data about happiness, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a few questions. Um, one is, um, in terms of the data sets, to what extent were Israeli Arabs, is, you know, is Arab citizens of Israel, yep. as well as Palestinians and the Palestinian yep. Authority um, included in these yep. surveys? A very good question. To what extent, also a, a related question, you know, perhaps, you know, I mean, one has to account for, I mean, and, and you're sort of pointing to the Declaration of Independence, um, was, um, you know, relates to People who know me know that I'm not much of a social constructivist, or not as much as many are, but there is a history of emotion, right? And people conceptualize emotions in different ways, and also we are more aware of them. You know, had we popped into some place in the Middle Ages and asked people similar sorts of questions in a language that they could understand, would we have gotten similar answers or no? How do you, I'm sure you've thought about that. How do you think about that? And, the pol and one other political, uh, um, Question here. I'd like to acknowledge this is coming from my our our uh, colleague uh, Professor Meredith Sue Lancer, who's a good friend of, of the center as well, uh, where she asks, assuming these data are coming primarily from Israeli Jews, and I'll leave you to answer that. Mm -hmm. The level of happiness and the level of fear essentially disincentivizing resolving Israel's Palestinian conflict. Um, and are there interventions that one could imagine that could recalibrate public? investment in a, in a resolution, which is also perhaps slightly restating Shira's question um, in a different way. And, you know, and also finally, how do we count for religion in, in half? Oh. <laughs> it also relates to this, I mean, we could talk about this endlessly, like what exactly is happiness and what is, you exactly. know, <laughs> one of the things that I've actually worked on is the word that gets translated as happiness. What exactly did it mean in medieval Hebrew? and you know, what it meant flourishing, what it meant all kinds yep. of things. Yep. But also, and this relates to the critiques of liberalism and religious critiques of liberalism in one of our, one mm -hmm. of our participants talked especially about, I mean, leaving aside Protestantism, Catholic critiques of liberalism, right? Yep. And then, you know, Catholicism, and we see it's been playing out in American press last few days 
uh, Catholic thinkers approaching this whole question with a very different perspective on the meaning of life and the meaning of death and, and embodiment mm -hmm. and the very idea of happen, finding fulfillment in this world. Yep. And so if you could please like theorize, thematize, problematize, and otherwise eyes, <laughs> you know, the way you've been sort of measuring, thinking of, um, you know, measuring happiness or reckoning yep. with happiness in this way that makes it a tool for analysis. Wow. Okay. Do you think that there's any chance that I'll be able to cover all of that? Is there or any just chance remember that all the questions? I'll do my best. <laughs> listen, there's no chance that any of us can cover anything that we purport to be experts on. So <laughs> go right ahead. So, so I'll, do, I'll do my best here. Okay. So first, about the extent to which those statistics cover also Israeli arms, they do. They do. So I show one. Uh, they do. They do cover Israeli arms. It calculates their take on happiness, both in terms of their enjoyment and in terms of how they perceive their life's well-being. Now, compared to right-wing and even centered in Israel, Israeli Arabs are less happy. But overall, they are happy. And if you, took, if you look at the overall trends, then Israel, with Israeli Arabs, is in a very prominent place worldwide when it comes to happiness. So they are part of that statistics. If it was only Israeli Jews, you would have seen Israel ranking even higher on that global mm -hmm. scale. Yeah. Now, about the nature of happiness, both if we look um, towards the past and to contemporary uh, realities and the, religion connect, the religious connection. Look, I would briefly say that, of course, happiness in it by itself is not a modern invention. People spoke about happiness, uh, tried to reach happiness before modernity. The meaning of happiness, however, has went through several transformations throughout the eras. I mean, if we compare our sense of happiness to the Aristotelian one, we can see some interesting distinction. And, you know, some scholars of happiness today do try to tap, for example, into the Aristotelian, Eudemendia uh, um, sense of happiness, but at the heart of it, it's mostly the way that we feel about our own life, satisfaction, and our passing emotion. Also, 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 I'd have to say that it seems to me that it's also that happiness is, sort of is in your hand, becomes a political issue. Yes. In yes. which ways, it, right. you know, in, in pre-modern thought, you know, among medieval political philosophers who talked about the kind of regime that conduces to human flourishing, that's about as political as happiness got, and it was entirely theoretical. And now in modernity, it's not. And it was very much, as I think you were hinting, entwined with theology. Yes. So in a sense, Christianity, but especially uh, Catholicism, yes. it wasn't so much about making people happy, right. but allowing them to make sense of their misery. Right. So you can be unhappy, but it all makes sense. Exactly. Because, well, predominantly, there is the afterlife. And yes. there, we can certainly speak about that unimaginable bliss that you will right. go through. Now, we should say that, of course, we have to go even beyond monotheistic civilization in order to fully comprehend of the course. nature of happiness and its public yes. dimension. Uh, because in Eastern philosophies and religions, happiness does have its place also in the public space. For right. example, as we know, one of the keystones of uh, Buddhism is right. to cope with the question of not so much happiness, but the flip side of pain, of suffering, right. and the attempt to go beyond the self in order to fully realize that all suffering is in a sense illusion. And so you can right. be, if not happy, then at least content. Which also, this gives us a different way of looking at Max Weber's, you know, interworldly asceticism with Protestantism. Mm -hmm. and yes. Thing. yes. I've also yes. been yes. following how some yes. Catholic social thought has been responding to Corona, but I'm happy to announce that we have a uh, question from um, another student, one of our undergrads, Leon Crime. Uh, Leon asks, you said Israeli Arabs are less happy than right-wing or centrist Israelis. Mm -hmm. um, how do Israeli Arabs compare to left-wing Israelis, who one would presume? Almost on par, almost on par, yeah. Almost on par with the uh, Israeli, and we should say that the Wait, so, so almost on a par with whom, if you could be with clear? With, with Israeli Jewish left. The Israeli Jewish left is as unhappy as Israeli Arabs. Yes, um, but we should note that Israeli left today, statistically speaking, is 
to a certain, in some poles, almost smaller than Israeli arms. Uh -huh. Okay, right. so we have a substantial part that is right wing, um, and not marginal, a, a quite important part of Israeli public that identifies as center. Um, and the left, the self-identified left, is pretty marginal when we speak about the Israeli Jewish public. Mm -hmm. And so in that regard, Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews are on par here. And look, throughout the last couple of months, I don't know if, if you've noticed that, but there have been some remarkable changes in the way that Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs relate to each other, even and perhaps especially amidst the coronavirus crisis. Mm -hmm. I think that if the politicians would have been braver, there was an actual chance of having Israeli our party as part and parcel of a new coalition that would have defied so many of those elements of uh, fear. Um, as it seems to be today, that's not the case, at least for now. Um, Great. So I, we, have, we have time for one more question, and it's okay. Together, some things that people have said in the chat and we're bringing you back in a sense to where you were at the beginning. Early okay. on, you spoke about neoliberalism and mm -hmm. the way capitalism is working today. Uh, one of the questions, so it's, it's to what extent does the choice and the way capitalism thinks of choice and celebrates choice and, and sort of thinks about takes, takes human, the human will and frames it in terms of consumer choices, how does that relate to um, this question of, of happiness? Is, it, is, is, is this kind of choice, liberalism menu way of looking yeah. at the world, a recipe <laughs> for unhappiness um, in its own way? And, yeah. and, and how do you see sort of the deep structures of, the, of our economic system and these questions of happiness um, uh, sort of playing themselves out. And one last thing to all of our participants, thank you all. And since we're pretty much towards the end and hopefully uh, Zoom won't crash, if you would like to um, sort of make, and you know, sort of enable us to, if you'd like to start your videos so that we can all see one another um, at least towards the end of our time together, uh, please feel free to do so. I'm going to do that now. That's an excellent question, really. Yes, uh, it's so. the most important one and I would, Okay, it's a long story. One element is that we have to make, I think, a distinction between choice, options, and decisions. They are mm -hmm. not one and the same. And also, when we try to tap into the question of choice, we have to ask ourselves to what extent the choice that we're speaking about is a moral choice, to what extent it taps into a moral dilemma. Most of the supposed choices that we see under the umbrella of late capitalism or neoliberalism are not of that sort, are not of the sort of the moral dilemma. It's more about the economic decisions that we take among various economic options that are mostly practical and material. They are less about the moral dimension. So perhaps you remember that at certain, you know, early point in, in the talk, I mentioned the moral dilemma that in a sense we are facing now. To what extent do we support the uh, weak in terms of health or the weak in terms of economy. Now that's a moral dilemma. It's not a practical dilemma. That's a choice that is required of us. And that's not a choice so much within neoliberalism itself, but it, it's a choice that neoliberalism has invited. And so I think summoning a greater choice, a greater moral dilemma about the very viability of neoliberalism as an economic system, okay? And in that regard, I think that the coronavirus uh, crisis invites us to humanity's either or moment. Do we opt for this or for that? Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, so Uriel, thank you so much for presenting and you all. overcoming all kinds of logistical obligations <laughs> and difficulties. Thank you, as always, to the remarkable staff of the Schusterman Center. Honestly, yes. on my behalf as well. Singer, <laughs> Shana Weiss, um, our director, Professor Sarna, um, for managing to pull all of this together. And thank you very, very much to all of you. We managed to somehow create, despite every, <laughs> despite the world's best efforts, uh, to the contrary, we managed to create a genuine exchange here. Um, 
and we look forward to seeing you um, all again. And thank you so very, very much. And thank you all and everyone. Take good care of yourselves. And um, I just want to remind everyone who's still here all. that on the 31st, yes. we'll be having a our next seminar um, on Yiddish in Israel. And it should also be really great. And please join. It'll also be at the same time, noon Eastern time. Right. And also, we will have one, and towards the end of the semester, we will also have a presentation right. with Tomer Persico on sort of the Temple Mount and uh, the, the, the area that Zionism can't live with and can't live without. Okay. So thank, thank you, you everyone. very much, and especially to our students. Thank you for participating, and everyone take good care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.